My name is Connor Volcady, and I am an NDSU student here for my second year doing some engineering, and I'm absolutely loving it. But honestly, I really didn't have a very deep connection with Christ until about a year ago, when I myself got invited by some family here, and actually in the Fargo area. I, I knew him before, I knew Christ, I knew of him, but I really didn't have that deep connection. But it wasn't until someone extended the offer about Hope Lutheran Church that I start coming here regularly. And let me tell you, the warm feeling that I've been just dying to see every single week is always here. Coming here on Sundays in the morning, having a donut and coffee, and worshiping with the Lord with those around me is just so amazing. So recently, I have actually been trying to extend the offer to my friends, and seeing them come with me every Sunday has also just been deeply rewarding. So one, one little piece of information I want to share with any one of you guys who are listening is you'll never know what someone says until you extend that offer. I was waiting for that offer for probably years, maybe even like five years before that one little offer, an invitation was invited to me. So please, if you ever thinking about maybe inviting a coworker or a friend, or maybe it's like a kid, please extend that offer because you'll never know what they'll say. Good morning. It is a delight to be with you. I'm Pastor Mike Toomey. I'm one of your pastors here on staff. I say along with Rachel's welcome, for those of you worshiping online, I want to welcome you who are worshiping online as well. So we're in this sermon series called Eyewitness, and what we're trying to do is figure out how we can look back on some of those first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. How can you and I be better witnesses to Christ Jesus in our lives and through our particular actions? Today, we're going to talk about Stephen. Now, I don't mean Pastor Stephen. Yes, Stephen is, Pastor Stephen is a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, but we're going to talk today about St. Stephen, the first martyr of the church, the one whom we heard the story about in that first lesson. You know, this is a really deep story, so let's take some time to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for Stephen, for his witness to you, for his sacrifice. Thank you for your love that continues to work in and through that. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life, for his death, for his resurrection. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to not only believe, but to be great witnesses to your love at work in Christ. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said... Well, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me ask you this question right off the bat. For what would you lay your life down for? For whom would you die? Let me tell you about one of my heroes. One of my heroes is a, a man by the name of Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a theologian, a great theologian, a, a good pastor, a, a wonderful writer of the last century. In the 1920s, he moved from Germany into the United States. He, he learned a little bit here in the United States. And, and when things were getting really ugly in Germany, when, when, when things were just going south and the Nazis were taking over, he had a choice. He could stay here. He could stay in relative safety. Or he could go back to Germany. He could go and try to share the love and conviction of God through Christ Jesus and maybe change something there. And so he took up his cross and he went back to Germany. He wrote some of the, uh, some awesome material while he was there. A book that everyone should read called Life Together. Another one called The Cost of Discipleship. He wrote a book called Ethics. Um, it was published po after he died. Um, it, it is probably the best practical theology that has ever been written. Somehow Dietrich Bonhoeffer got caught up in an assassination attempt of Adolf Hitler. And we don't know exactly how deep he was into the attempt, but he got named with those who were named. And he was brought into prison. I mean, obviously he wasn't going to get a good trial. 
And so while he was in prison, he continued to pastor the other prisoners. He continued to preach the good news. He even preached the good news to the guards who were keeping him there. And when Germany knew that it was going to lose the war, they decided to wreck as much havoc as they could possibly do, to do as much damage as they possibly could before they surrendered. And one of the things they did is they ordered the execution of all of the political prisoners, including Dietrich Bonhoeffer. One of Bonhoeffer's fellow prisoners wrote this of his execution. I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor praying fervently to God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and then climbed a few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. One of the other prisoners in, in the camp, a Royal Air Force pilot who had been captured, asked Bonhoeffer before he went to the gallows, he said, if I ever make it out of here, what message do you want me to carry back to your family, to your friends, to the church, and to the world? And Bonhoeffer said this, this is the end. But for me, it is the beginning of life. This is the beginning of life. So let's come back to the question, for what would you give your life for? For whom would you die? St. Stephen, his story begins in the book of Acts, and his story begins when the church is experiencing a problem. It's one of those really good problems that, that the church has. In other words, there just weren't enough leaders. There was a couple different types of Christians at this point. Most of the Christians were Jewish by heritage at this point, and some of them normally spoke Greek, and some of them normally spoke Hebrew, and they're kind of a little different, and, and they were beginning to argue and gripe with one another that some of them were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Some of the widows of, of one were thinking that they were being overlooked, and so they knew they needed more leaders. The apostles were doing everything they possibly could, and so what they decided to do was to get seven more leaders, seven more men who were devout, who were faithful who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Stephen is the first one that they name. That's how they describe him to begin with, a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit, full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about the story of St. Stephen is the Bible never tells us that he went out and did what they called him first to do. It never really says that he went out and actually fed the widows. We assume he did, but the Bible quickly moves on from that, and they begin to talk about what Stephen was doing in a more public sphere. It, it reads like this in Acts chapter 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. He's performing miracles, signs, wonders. Everybody is wondering what is going on with this man. And they're surrounding him and they're listening to the message of Jesus that he's bringing. But as he's doing this, opposition begins to build. Some of this opposition is coming from a very specific synagogue, a group of Jewish leaders. And they begin to hear him and they want to get him in trouble. They want him to stop. And so they bring charges against him. Charges that he was preaching against the temple. Charges that he was preaching against Moses. Charges that he was blaspheming the very name of God. So they bring him to the Sanhedrin, the same people that tried Jesus. And there they lay out their trial. 
as they lay out their trial, as they give out all of the things that they are going to do, one of the things that's really interesting that Luke, the author of Acts, wants you to know is this, that Stephen's face was like that of an angel. Kind of like he was a baby face. Innocent. He, he, Luke wants you to know that Stephen was innocent. But there's more to it than just that. He's not just talking about that he's a young looking guy. What they want you to know is that his face is being transfigured. This is something miraculous that is happening. His face is transfigured. There's another character in the Bible whose face happens to get transfigured as well. His name happens to be Moses. Every time Moses steps into the Holy of Holies, has a conversation with God, his face gets transfigured and he has to wear a veil over his face because it creeps the ordinary people out. The irony here is, as the charges are coming against him that he is preaching against Moses, that Stephen is the most Moses-like person in the audience. Stephen's chance to rebuke the charges. And he preaches the longest recorded sermon in the Bible, which gives me license to go long. He starts where all good Jewish people do, would do. He starts with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He goes on to um, uh, Joseph and, and, and how the people of Israel came down to live with the Egyptians for a period of time, but in that process that they became slaves to the Pharaoh and that God raised up Moses. He raised up a leader for them to bring them from slavery into freedom. And that's exactly what Moses did. He, he got the people to move from Egypt. And then they escaped the Egyptians. They went through the Red Sea and they brought them to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, God was going to do this miraculous, powerful thing. And indeed he did. He gave Moses the law. Not just a, a, a bunch of rules, but a contract, a, a covenant saying that the, this people are my people. I am going to be their God. I have delivered them. That this is my pure grace coming down upon them. And this is how they're going to live. But as Moses was getting the law of God, when God, when he was getting this covenant, they began to reject Moses. They began to reject God. The people down there, they get antsy. They, get, they don't have a leader for some, something. And so they, they, they make for themselves an idol, a golden calf. And Moses comes down and he sees that they have rejected him. They've rejected God. And that's where Stephen is picking up his sermon. He says, as we rejected God at Mount Sinai, as we rejected Moses, his servant, we too are stiff-necked people who have rejected God in Jesus Christ. He gives them the opportunity to repent. And they don't want to stand for it at all. They rush at him. And as they begin to rush at him, Stephen sees heaven and earth, the veil between torn open. And there he begins to speak. He says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And with that, they drag him out of the city. They throw him off the cliff. They stone him. Even through his execution, Stephen gives witness to Christ. For just as Jesus said words as he was being executed, Stephen echoes them. This is what Stephen says. He, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And with that, he fell asleep. I 
I want to say this. The Lord didn't cause Stephen's suffering. The Lord didn't cause Stephen's persecution. The ones who caused Stephen's persecution... They were the leaders of the synagogue. They were the leaders of the Sanhedrin. It was a crowd that was easily persuaded. They were the ones that caused and purposed Stephen's death. But God would not waste this suffering. God would use it. God would turn it back towards his purpose. The first thing that he did that you heard read was God scatters his church. He scatters his church like seeds carried by the wind to grow in new soil. Jesus had said as much earlier on in the very first part of Acts where Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The church is looking forward to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God scatters them. God just didn't use his story 2,000 years ago, but God has been continuing to use and to repurpose Stephen's suffering for the sake of the church. For through this story, God has inspired Christians for 2,000 years to be bold and faithful in the very face of persecution. It has given numerous, countless Christians comfort who are suffering for the sake of of Christ. In the book of Acts, it's basically like this. As Jesus did, so does Christ's church. As Jesus did, so does the church of Christ. And that includes suffering. So as Jesus suffered, so will the church of Christ suffer in this world. That shouldn't be a surprise. When Jesus was doing his earthly ministry amongst us in Luke's, in the Gospel of Luke, it's recorded that Jesus says this to his disciples so that you and I can hear them and be inspired them. When then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We're not all going to suffer physical persecution but we will all face persecution in some way, shape, and form. See, Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Every day we do this. And sometimes we cause our own suffering. Sometimes it's our own sinful actions that causes the suffering that happens in our lives. Lay down your sin and take up your cross and follow Jesus. But sometimes the suffering that we have in this world, the persecution that we have, comes from without. Sometimes it's like when a boss tells you to lie, cheat, and steal. When a boss tells you profit over people. Sometimes it's when a person of authority and power makes it difficult for you or your children or your grandchildren the capacity to worship. There are a hundred thousand million ways that persecution comes into our lives each and every day. But each and every day we have a choice whether to take up our cross and follow Jesus or whether we continue to follow the evil ways of this world. Stephen shows us the way that Christ Jesus taught. Take up your cross and follow. Be a witness to Christ Jesus in everything you say and do, even if there is a cost involved, especially when there is a cost involved. The Christian church responded to suffering in several different ways. As I read through the book of Acts, I I, I see these early Christians trying to figure out what does it mean to suffer. And one of the surprising ways that the Christian church learned about suffering and how they reacted to suffering was this, they rejoiced. 
They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they rejoiced when they suffered. In Acts chapter 5, verse 4, it reads something along this line, that they were rejoicing because they had been considered worthy of suffering disgrace for Jesus. Wow, they rejoiced. How will you rejoice when you suffer for the sake of Christ? The other thing is they scattered. You, you heard that in this particular reading. They scattered. They, they were dispersed. They moved to where they needed to go. Yes, suffering is a part of the walk with Christ Jesus. But they didn't need to be sitting ducks. If they could move, they moved. And wherever they moved, they carried that same gospel with them so that it could be multiplied, so that more people could know the assurance of God's love. They found great comfort in sharing the stories of their fellow Christians who were suffering. And what they tried to tell you and me is this that suffering is temporary. Persecution is temporary. And God's mercy and God's love and God's life is eternal. Let me say that again. Suffering is temporary, but God's life is eternal. And they were strengthened. I I hear this story of Stephen and when he looked up into heaven and he he saw that for him the veil between heaven and earth was no longer any there. He was strengthened because Christ Jesus was with him. In the middle of that pain, Christ Jesus stood up for Stephen. In the middle of that pain, Stephen knew that this was not the end, but that it was the beginning of new life. How does Luke tell us that? It says that Stephen fell asleep. And when you hear that word, you know that he woke up in the presence of God. Folks, I have a lot of hope and a lot of prayers for you. And some of them involve simply that I want you, my hopes and prayers for you, is I want you to hear Jesus' words and I want you to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and I want you to follow him daily. It's unlikely that any one of you will ever face physical persecution. But if you do, and when the rest of us face any type of persecution. I want you to know this, that heaven is torn open, that Christ Jesus is standing there for you. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is with you. He's already been there, and he's already opened up eternal life for you and that he is with you in the midst of suffering and persecution bringing you life forgiveness salvation amen let's pray God and Father thank you thank you for Jesus help us to be bold Help us to be brave. Help us to be faithful so that people will see the love of your son Jesus and the promise of everlasting life that he brings to this world. Walk with us all of our days through the power of your Holy Spirit and help us to know that this is the beginning of life. Amen.